Welcome to the Space Flight Operations Facility at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. This is the home of NASA's Deep Space Network. In this room is the nerve center of the network, of, uh, of, of the network that communicates with spacecraft across the solar system. Commands are both sent to those spacecraft, over 30 of them, and data is received here on the ground from those spacecraft located millions and billions of miles away from Earth. When we say deep space, we're not exaggerating. Hello and welcome. I'm Veronica McGregor, and this is our 80th NASA social event. Thank you so much, everyone. We've been holding NASA social events at NASA centers and in other locations across the country since 2009 as a way to bring in the public to see what their space agency is doing and to spend a day or even two days behind the scenes. They'll have the opportunity to talk to the spacecraft engineers, the scientists, and the technicians who make the Deep Space Network operate. You may recognize this particular room that we're in. This is the same room that the Curiosity landing team used in August of 2012 to watch intently as the Curiosity rover uh, uh, became closer to Mars and then ultimately safely landed on the planet. Uh, of course, the Deep Space Network is crucial to all of our spacecraft operations, and you're going to hear from the people today, you're going to hear from the scientists and engineers who rely on it, uh, the people in this room get the added bonus of tomorrow. They're going to the Goldstone Complex that's located near Barstow, California. That is one of three locations around the world where we have the Deep Space Network antenna. And uh, believe me, when you're standing in the shadow of a 230-foot dish, you will be very impressed. The pictures absolutely do not do it justice. Now, for those of you who are watching on NASA TV or, or the live stream, Obviously, you can't be with us tomorrow, but I want to tell you that we're using the hashtag DSN50, so you can follow. Hopefully, everyone here in the room is going to be uh, posting a lot to either Instagram or Twitter or any of the other social media platforms. Follow that hashtag, and you'll be able to see all those pictures both later today and tomorrow when we're out there at Goldstone. All right, so now we're going to start with a short overview that explains just what is the Deep Space Network. Deep Space Network is basically required to do the kinds of things that we do in space. Clearly, if you can't talk to your spacecraft and they can't talk to you, there's no point in even sending them out there. The Deep Space Network uh, makes everything that we do possible. Imagine landing night, for example, for Curiosity, without the Deep Space Network. There'd be no one in there because there'd be nothing to see. They would hear nothing from the spacecraft. No touchdown confirmed, no cheering, no nothing. The Deep Space Network is what helps us figure out where the spacecraft is. We wouldn't even get close to Mars without it. The Deep Space Network comprises of three complexes around the world, placed about 120 degrees apart. We are constantly in touch with the spacecraft as the Earth rotates. We're today tracking 33 spacecrafts, not only the U.S. spacecrafts, all sorts of spacecrafts from other countries. And remember, this is not only talking to the spacecraft. We have been able to do radar and radio astronomy and it was the radar on this antenna that actually was used for even the men landing on the moon. These antennas are generally receive objects, but they also use to transmit, so we do radar with them. We can start to tell either bowlers on the surface of an asteroid by beaming radar waves and then getting them back. Radar provides hundred thousands times better understanding of the orbit of one of these asteroids. It's incredibly important if you want to make sure it's not coming at us. If you look at the Cassini mission, we've got a transmitter about an average of 800, 900 million miles away. The transmitter is about the power of your refrigerator light bulb. And that is what is bringing all these incredible images and data back. I think it's a resource to be treasured, but it's a resource that also needs to be nourished. Seeing our success in, in an almost real time and, uh, and knowing right away and seeing those pictures, all possible because of the DSM. Okay, so our first speakers today joining us will be two of the people who are very well connected with the Deep Space Network. You're going to hear a lot of cool titles today, uh, and here are two. First, we have uh, Joseph Lazio. He is the chief scientist for the Interplanetary Network, 
and Wayne Sibyl. He is the deputy project manager for the Deep Space Network. Come on over. They're going to show you, uh, share with you a little bit about what they do and how this network operates, and then we'll have time for some questions and answers afterwards. Thank you, Veronica. Good morning, and thank you for coming. Um, this is a big year for the DSN. 50 years was celebrated back on December 24th last year. Um, that was the day 50 years prior to that that uh, um, the lab director at the time, Dr. Pickering, established the Deep Space Network. And from that time on, both from Apollo days through uh, Curiosity rover, um, uh, the DSN has been there to make sure that we have that vital link to the spacecraft. Once it clears the tower at launch, the only way to communicate with these spacecrafts is through the DSN. And the DSN is the only lifeline from the time you get to the moon and beyond that allows the commands to get to the spacecraft, uh, allows sequences to be uploaded, allows data to be returned, and science, all the science that comes back, um, wouldn't be possible without the DSN. So let me sort of describe how things work. This is the dark room. You guys were, uh, were uh, in that dark room a little bit earlier. What you see is the complement of people we have normally, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, about five people per shift, four to five. And they're the ones that establish the communication link between the spacecraft mission controllers, wherever they're located around the world, and the link operators who are actually driving the antenna. Those folks will make sure that the predicts get out to the antennas so they can point properly. They'll make sure that the data flows to and from the antennas to the missions. Um, they make sure that the data that comes in, gets processed and distributed throughout the world to the, to the investigators. It's, a, it's a, uh, not a glamorous job, but it's a critical job. If they don't do that job, you don't get commands to the spacecraft to tell it to point, to capture a comet, to, capture a, to, to execute a landing. So it's a, it's a vital, critical job that's handled by just a few people. And they're in the background. You don't really see them. There's probably five people back there right now. And then around the world, the way the DSN was set up, I think I have a graphic, um, an animation that uh, um, has been prepared to show um, the rotation. We have a complex in just outside of Canberra, Australia, just outside of Madrid, Spain, and out in the Goldstone. Goldstone is where you'll be tomorrow, and you get a chance to see all the antennas we have out there. But these are spaced about 120 degrees apart, so at any time, any missions that, that's at the moon and beyond, we can stay in constant contact, sending commands, receiving information. So if a spacecraft gets into trouble, we're that first line of defense. We notify the missions. We, we allow them to start commanding right away. Um, and that's their link. That's the only way that they can survive. And around the world, we have um, a number of antennas. The most are at Goldstone, which is where you'll be tomorrow. Um, we have... Um, the next number in Madrid, which is four antennas, and then we have currently have three operating antennas in Australia, but we're also building two new antennas in Australia. Um, one goes operational this October, one two years later. This will help balance the load between the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere so that we can always um, make contact with the missions. Um, it's, it's, it's a great, great environment to work in. It's challenging because each one of these complexes around the world has their own power generation. Um, they also get commercial power, but if for some reason we don't have commercial power, we can't say, uh, we can't support you, uh, Project X. Um, so, so we have uh, generating power to power the entire complex at each of the three locations. Uh, we have a faultless power system at Goldstone and Madrid, so that if power fails, automatically the generators kick in and the entire complex is picked up on batteries until the generators spin up. It's a, uh, um, it's manned by probably about 150 people at Goldstone, 100 at uh, Madrid, and 100 at uh, Canberra, and they're dedicated to seeing and making sure the missions are successful. Um, it's mostly behind the scenes. You don't see the projects. Um, you know, when, you, when you saw Curiosity landing uh, in this room full of people, you didn't see the DSN, but they were behind the scene making sure it was successful. Um, let me give you... Uh, Dr. Lazio, to explain a little bit about the science return and the science the DSN does. Thanks, Wayne. Um, Wayne has already made this comment. I think Veronica has, has said it as well, but, and you saw it somewhat in that video. Essentially, any image that we get back from planets, 
Mars, Venus, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn. Think Juno, the spacecraft that's currently en route to, to Jupiter. New Horizons, the spacecraft that's en route to Pluto. That all flows through those antennas. And in fact, this graphic is showing the communications with antennas, with, uh, well, between the antennas and the spacecraft. Now, the other thing I want to sort of draw your attention to or, you know, plant the seed, there's some other uses of these antennas for science. Let me give you one example. Consider something like MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, that's actually orbiting a planet. Well, it's kind of obvious, right? When the spacecraft goes behind the planet, you can't get the signal. That's a duh. But now suppose the planet has an atmosphere. As the spacecraft goes behind, the signal has to pass through the atmosphere. And you might worry, ooh, is this going to cause a problem for the reception of the signal? Is it going to somehow corrupt the signal? Or you can turn that around and say, hey, if I can track that signal very accurately, I can probe the planet's atmosphere without actually putting anything in it. And in fact, these antennas are so sensitive and the tracking is done so precisely, not only can you start thinking about the atmosphere, but remember the spacecraft moves with response to the gravity within the planet, right? So depending upon how mass or matter is distributed within the planet, we can actually start to figure out what the interior of the planet or the satellite looks like. So if you've ever heard, for instance, of subsurface oceans on Europa or Ganymede, some of the evidence comes from that kind of spacecraft tracking of as it moves around the, the moon. There's another uh, use. This particular antenna, the Gold DSS-14, the, the 70 meter out at Goldstone, which you'll see tomorrow, sometimes uh, actually beams intense radio waves out. We use it for radar. And you saw in the video, they, when we get the reflection, you can actually start making images equivalent to as if you'd send a spacecraft there. I'm not going to tell you anything more about that because Marina Brockovitz is going to come in and show you some amazing images. And again, the other reason that you really care about that, of course, is that you get the orbit very precisely and you want to know that if there's, if there's any potential issue. Uh, issue in the sense of is it coming at us. Um, the, other, the other sort of, let me bring this now from the science to sort of our, our uses here at home. Perhaps you've had an experience with a radar gun. Say you've been at a, a Dodgers or a Washington National or Chicago Cubs baseball game. You've seen the little, you know, how fast did the pitcher pitch that? Well, the kinds of radar that are used in everyday usage, such as sports even, many of those technologies came, for thing, came from technologies that were initially either invented at or developed by the DSN. You see me flashing around this thing, and I see various people with them. This thing is packed with a couple of different technologies that, again, either were invented by or, if not invented, were developed here in a way that you could move it from this precise scientific use into something that's for commercial value. And then my final picture, let me step back now from sort of the science to and the, the neat technology, you know, uh, radar guns and how fast uh, pitchers pitch baseballs. Think about some of the greatest moments in human history. And there should be a still showing up here, you know, humans actually setting foot on another celestial planet, uh, another celestial world. Or the Voyager spacecraft were sort of on the verge of becoming an interstellar spacefaring civilization delivered by the DSN. I think we can take some questions now. Okay, so we've got a few minutes for questions, and uh, if you have one, go ahead and raise your hand uh, if you want to know a little bit more about what people do day to day here, and just wait for a microphone to come to you. Alice, we have, you might, it might be easier from the front. Okay. We got it. All right, go ahead. Thank you. When you're looking at that graphic that you have up there, the animation, so when it's grayed out, what does that mean? When you see those things coming in, those waves... Is that specifically from one or multiple ones? That means they're active at that time. That means, for example, on, on DSS-54, which is in Spain, a beam waveguide antenna is currently tracking the SOHO spacecraft. Um, it's the, the, the signal is you're doing both uplinking and downlinking at the same time. Um, this this uh, um, DSS-34 down in Australia, that means we're tracking two, and two spacecraft at the same time at Mars. They're sharing the link. Uh, only one can be uplinking at one time, but both are downlinking at the same time. And this actually, this display is available from the web. Anybody can have access to it. Thank can you. I just can I just uh, expand one? When when Wayne says uplink and downlink, uplink is the command. Downlink is the actual data. And of course, if it's not obvious, the reason this one can do those two is because they're both in orbit about Mars. So this, the antenna essentially sees both at the same time. 
And uh, I'll also let you know that uh, Doug Ellison is going to show us a little bit more about this tool and explain how it works. And it is, uh, you can find it at deepspace.jpl.nasa.gov and click on DSN Now. So anyone can watch this at home if you're interested to see which spacecraft are in communication with Earth at that moment. Any other questions? One more? Okay, we'll get the microphone to you and then, and then we'll come to you next. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh uh, when I was in the Air Force, I used to work on power production. What kind of uh, generator plant do they have to operate the radio telescopes like this? Well, we're generally with commercial power, and at Goldstone, I believe it's about 4.5 megawatts is what we take for the entire complex. It, not gigawatts, no. Um, <laughs> megawatts. And at the overseas complexes, they have fewer antennas and don't have radar, so they don't have the higher demand, so they're, they're closer to 2.5 to 3 megawatts of power that's required. And is the power plant located right on site? It is, okay. yes. So if they were, for some reason, that you couldn't get out to the complex, they could hunker down and be powered on their own. There's water. There's, they can pretty much self-sustain like any city. And I understand this room has been going 24-7 since what year? Oh, uh, it, 40 years, is that right? About 40 years. This room has been operating 24-7 since, uh, yeah, about 40 years now, so. And you even have a backup for this room, so, I mean, there's redundancy and redundancy in the system to make right. sure. This, this area out here, the dark room, we actually have a backup facility located not too far from here, about 18 miles away, and should there be some event that requires you to move out of the San Gabriel Valley area, we have a facility out at the Goldstone Complex where we can operate the network from there. And uh, I think the closest that ever happened was when we had a massive wildfire burning uh, behind JPL a few years ago. Right. But uh, but we stayed, right? right? We stayed, yeah. Um, only those employees that had to stay here, but um, that was a uh, very close fire. Okay, well, we'll have you go, and then we have one over here. So go ahead. What is the transmitted wattage at, for the commands going up? Uh, it varies up to 20 kilowatts. Uh, we have an 80 kilowatt transmitter that's in development right now, so that if we didn't have... Sorry, if, if we didn't have the 70 meter and its 20 kilowatt transmitter, then we could go to a 34 meter with an 80 kilowatt transmitter and get the same power to the spacecraft. But that's under development. We're going to be deploying that uh, next year at Goldstone, the first production unit, and then eventually, over time, we'll get it deployed throughout the network, at least one at each complex. Uh, I had a question about something you said. I thought I heard you say that we're on the verge of becoming intergalactic. Uh, Interstellar. Interstellar. That's what I meant. <laughs> um, so is there some debate on that? Like, when is Voyager 1 officially, like, becoming an interstellar? No, the only thing I meant by that is I think there is a consensus now that Voyager 1 is essentially beyond the solar system. It's beyond the strictly heliopause, I believe, is, is the boundary, uh, where the the influence of the sun is no longer the dominant. It's into interstellar space. But it's essentially only one spacecraft, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I sort of mean by on the verge of Voyager 2 will eventually make it. It's not clear if we'll still be in contact with Voyager 2 when it exits. Uh, people have been thinking for a long time about how could we get spacecraft, not just sort of right at the edge, but actually well out into interstellar space. And, and so it's sort of we're on the verge mm -hmm. You know, think back 50 years or something when we were just starting to launch spacecraft. We're sort of now just starting to get beyond the boundaries of the solar system in comparison to the, the dozens of, of spacecraft that, that we sent throughout the solar system. Cool. Okay, I think I saw one more question over here. Uh, yes, uh, uh, sorry for asking this question because I think I'm bringing everybody down on Earth, to Earth again. Uh, my question is, I think everybody's uh, question these days is, uh, is that why uh, we cannot, for example, or NASA cannot communicate with this uh, lost plane, which is somewhere on Earth, and, but we can still, we can still uh, communicate with Voyager, which is uh, 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 virtually out of this world, I mean, completely. What is the difference between these two technologies? Our antennas are pointing up. <laughs> and we don't have the ability to point down. Uh, so there's nothing that we can do with our, our tracking network. Um, other agencies have other assets, and I'm sure they're playing their part in trying to do that. But, but we don't have that ability. Mm. All right. 
Okay. Um, well, actually, we need to wrap up, um, but you know, you're going to have plenty of time over the next day and a half to ask some more questions. But we do want to keep the program moving right now. So I want to thank both Wayne and Joe Flasio for um, spending some time with us this morning and, and taking some questions from the group. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming. Okay, um, coming up now, uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, few members of the uh, Curiosity Landing Team, some of the engineers here. <laughs> you want us? I see there are people uh, sitting in our chairs. <laughs> <laughs> They've taken your seats for today. Um, everyone, this is Steve Collins, Ann Devereaux, and Bobak Ferdosi. And um, why don't you go ahead and take a spot at the front of the room this time instead of behind the console. I know that's a little different for you. And <laughs> they're going to explain to you a little bit about uh, what makes the DSN so important for them when they are in a room like this. And so to start with that, though, we are going to take you back to landing night. Please watch the video over here. Things are looking good. Coming up on entry. The able reports entry interface. At this time, it will begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. We are standing by for guided start, start of guided entry. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. The vehicle is just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. At this time, the vehicle is beginning to steer its way to the target. We have seen peak deceleration. That is starting its first bank reversal. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth G's. Yes. Bank reversal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Speed chill step has separated where we found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers in descending. Standing by for back shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane has started. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. <laughs> Today, right now, the wheels of curiosity have begun to blaze the trail for human footprints on Mars. This is an amazing achievement. Well, today on Mars, history was made on Earth. The successful landing of curiosity marks what is really an unprecedented technological tour de force. 
it will stand as an American point of pride far into the future. Well, tonight was, was a great drama that was played. I could only think of the words of Teddy Roosevelt as I was sitting there. It is far better to dare mighty things even though we might fail than to stay in the twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Who needs a Kleenex? <laughs> um, I do have them. I'll send them back. Um, I always joke, uh, we play these for this uh, video for tour groups on many different occasions, and you can always tell a room full of JPLers because we all um, still live the emotion of that night, don't we? Um, so, Ann, Bobak, and Steve, uh, why don't you um, go ahead and talk about what you were doing that night in this room, how the DSN plays a role in, in something like a landing night, a major event like this. Uh, sure. So I was uh, sitting right over here in the activity lead chair, as, as you are, um, and we were just kind of monitoring telemetry. It's, uh, what's amazing about that night, of course, is I mean, as probably many of you guys know, there was this 14-minute delay between uh, the events actually happening and the signal we received here on Earth. So what we were kind of seeing was all kind of post-fact, right? It was basically like taking your SATs or your GREs and just waiting for the results to happen. Um, so there's kind of this weird feeling in the room that uh, there's a little bit, at least for me, a little bit of like, well, it's all done already, um, but we're just waiting for the results. And, you know, we had the tones, which was basically the spacecraft talking directly back to Earth. Um, but those cut out just about a minute before landing because that's when Earth was setting on Mars where we were. And then uh, in addition to that, we had these amazing things, uh, these two orbiters already at Mars, Odyssey and, and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, that the, the rover was talking to directly as it landed. And we were getting this data back, and of course, um, you know, one of the first things that we got back from the surface of Mars was this gorgeous picture of us just settled on the ground, our shadow, long shadow being cast, and Mount Sharp in the distance. That's the photo I chose over there, if you like. It's my favorite photo. Um, but one of the things I wanted to tell you is a kind of the long story that how uh, I got there, and one of the things I started on this project doing was, was mission planning. And the first thing kind of you do as a mission planner is you start working on what resources you have. And... We start talking about, okay, you know, on the, the trip to Mars, we need DSN passes because we need to communicate with the rover or to the spacecraft at the time, of course, um, every day uh, or maybe three days a week or whatever. And then we need to make sure that we have good navigation so we understand exactly where we're headed and how close we are to our targets. Uh, and Steve will probably tell you some exciting stories about that. Um, and I remember doing this for the first time and not knowing what was really happening because this is basically the first job I had. And, you know, writing these, these requirements for the Deep Space Network and asking, you know, okay, like, I, how much time do I need per week? And who's going to communicate once we're on the surface? Is it going to be one of the orbiters? Is it going to be us? And I wrote this thing out, and I deliver this, you know, this great, you know, first really proud document that says, here's all our requests. And I get it back, and someone says, why does it say Mars orbit insertion at the end, two years after landing? And I look and I realize that I've gone through this and submitted this thing for Mars sample return uh, instead of uh, our, our rover. Um, so that was a learning experience for me. But I think one of the things that kind of amazes me about this and, uh, was that really it took you know, me roughly nine years to get from that point to seeing that picture for the first time. And there's a little bit of a sense of relief because seeing that picture meant that I'd done my job. Um, I think all of us kind of has that sense, you know, like, I don't want to be the guy to screw it up for everybody. Um, but, you know, realizing everything that it takes to get there, and, and one of the things, of course, that it takes is not only, um, you know, a, a, a team of people who can design and implement something like this, but also, you know, the rover itself with this communication, talking to an orbiter that is passing overhead, that is relaying data back here to Earth all at the same time. Um, that's an incredible achievement, and I'm, I'm kind of really proud to be a part of it. Um, hi there, uh, my name is Steve Collins, and I'm an attitude control engineer. Uh, we have a giant machine in the basement that makes sure that everybody is happy. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, attitude uh, control <clears throat> is the part of the spacecraft that uh, keeps the spacecraft pointed in the right direction. So uh, as we're flying Curiosity to Mars, uh, we have to keep the solar arrays pointed close to the sun so we get power and we need to keep the antennas that are on the spacecraft pointed close to Earth so that we uh, have communications with the uh, spacecraft. 
And uh, so I'm responsible for that. Uh, the, all the thrusters and gyroscopes and star cameras and stuff like that that do that. Um, also during the mission, uh, the attitude control system is used to make corrections to the spacecraft's trajectory. So the spacecraft has to show up at Mars at the top of the atmosphere, basically inside a football field, uh, in order for us to land in the place on Mars that we want to land and to land safely. And in order to do that, we have to correct the spacecraft's trajectory. We can't just launch it on a rocket from the Earth and hit that tiny little target uh, all the way at Mars. So during the course of the mission, maybe four or five times, we make a, uh, a correction to the spacecraft's uh, velocity. We fire the thrusters for a few seconds. Um, I, there's, a, there's a little piece of B-roll here that uh, shows the spacecraft just as we separated from the launch vehicle. And I really like this because you can see um, what's going to happen is the launch vehicle is going to de-spin and you can see the motion of the spacecraft as the launch vehicle de-spins there. So that's what the spacecraft looks like in flight and, and that's why I, I chose this little picture to show you guys. Um, we very rarely get to see a picture of the spacecraft actually flying in space. We usually, uh, you know, see it last down in the clean room and then have to imagine uh, it uh, for the rest of the mission. So we spin, the spacecraft spins at 2 RPM, and if we want to make a correction to the uh, trajectory, we have to fire the thrusters in a little pulse. And we do that a couple of times each rev as the spacecraft spins um, to, to tweak the orbit. And in order to make those corrections, the deep space network has to tell us where the spacecraft is. And they do that um, by giving us these things that we call dopples. Um, dopples are the information that's in the Doppler signature of the radio signal we're getting from the spacecraft. And the DSN can measure uh, the frequency of the radio signal that's coming from the spacecraft very, very accurately. We can measure the velocity of the spacecraft to like a tenth of a millimeter per second. And uh, we do that pretty much every time we have communication with the spacecraft. And the navigation team uses that to figure out where the spacecraft is in the solar system to within, you know, tens of meters. And, uh, and tells us, we want you to change the spacecraft's velocity by, uh, let's do eight millimeters per second today. You know, our final corrections to the trajectory are about that size. Um, so that's uh, some of the stuff that I... Uh, work with uh, during flight. and do you want to have your turn and say some things? So I'm Ann Devereaux. Um, I was actually sitting where the gentleman with the gray shirt was um, on landing night. And you can see, I mean, you can see it says chief engineer in front. I was not chief engineer. However, if I sidled close to the side, because the chief engineer was roaming the whole time, you might have thought I was chief <laughs> engineer uh, for that night. Um, anyway, so I am actually an electrical engineer by background, but like a lot of people at JPL, I have had many hats. Um, my particular disciplines uh, are telecom. Uh, actually, I, my group were the ones that built the relay radio, Electras, that are on uh, MSL. So when you hear them saying, oh, we have uh, you know signal from Odyssey, that was our radio, the Electra radio, had talked to Odyssey, and Odyssey had uh, telemetered it to the ground. Um, and so, actually, it's not in any of the roles, but randomly, I jumped up and I said, yay, Electra, because, you know, until then, we'd never had to do anything with it. I didn't know it was going to work. I mean, <laughs> I was hoping. Um, in any case... So uh, the other things that I have done, I, I was lucky on, on MSL, I was able to later on move over and be the lead flight system engineer. So that's the person that's responsible for making sure as the boxes come in that uh, construct the rover, that they are in fact the boxes that we expected, and that when you bolt them all together, they actually do what they, you expect. And so that's kind of the trick. And part of that is kind of my last uh, uh, field of expertise, which is autonomy. Uh, you know, you heard Bobic saying, you know, we have this giant time delay. Uh, between when uh, you know things actually happen on the vehicle and when we actually get to see it on the ground, um, and it's very much like I actually I looked up to see what the size of a of a tweet was, and of course the internet, as usual, is confused. However, it looked like something like maybe 4K uh, bits was the maximum uh, size for a message. So during uh, entry, descent, and landing, even when we got the, the the radios online, we were doing eight kilobits per second. So 
Probably nobody here is tweeting twice a second. That would be kind of fast. But if you think about it, that's the kind of information that we're getting back, basically. And it's kind of what Curiosity thinks is important, too. Like, I just did this. I just turned on some heaters. I just stopped this. I just broke my arm. I just went. And you're like, what? what, what? You just broke your arm? What? So... Um, in the days coming up to EDL, uh, uh, it was interesting. So realistically, um, we had sent the command that said, literally, I'm not giving any secrets away, do EDL, something like a week beforehand. And re really, the spacecraft, and Steve can correct me, the sta spacecraft, because we had just gotten a good lineup and we were going on a good uh, entry trajectory, the spacecraft could have landed by itself. Of course, we're the parents, right? We're the parents, you know, steadying the bicycle, and we want to help. And so from my kind of autonomy uh, hat, you know, I'd sit there, you know, not being chief engineer. I'd sit there and, you know, I'd worry, well, what if something happened? We had these big meetings. Well, what if something happened? You know, Curiosity decides she broke her arm. Now, what would happen is she would tweet, I broke my arm, I bandaged it up, it's to the side, I'm ready to go. Yeah, mm, headed for Mars. But we'd be like, w w do you broke your arm? Did you fall? Do how about the other arm? Is the other arm? We're like, we want to ask all these questions, but 14 minutes up, 14 minutes back. Plus, we have to craft the questions we want to ask. Plus, she's doing a lot of other stuff. She's really busy. She's hurtling toward Mars. And so it was, the, you know, the normal human uh, instinct would be to, 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 you know, well, what are you doing now? Well, what are you doing now? Well, I'm going to tweak this and tweak that. And we really had to balance that against, hey, she knows what she's doing. You can just let her go. But you only get the information that she sends you, and you only get it because you know, we have the, the links to the DSN and, uh, you know, the, the relay links, which is, you know, kind of one step on the way. Um, so it's very interesting for me. Actually, now I'm working on the next rover, the 2020 rover. So this is going to be Curiosity's, I don't know, fraternal twin, uh, perhaps. We're hoping to reuse a lot of the same systems. And it's interesting looking back on, you know, usually at JPL, you know, we we do one thing and then you move on. You're like, wow, I'm really glad that worked. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's move on and do something different. But now we have this opportunity to sit and think, well, you know, was that the right thing? You know, maybe we should have thought about intervening if something happened. Maybe we should have done this. Maybe, you know, for, for telecommunications, for example, um, you know, we had the, the, we were so lucky to have the, the good relays through Odyssey and MRO, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and still now a, a basic cadence of uh, Curiosity's daily life is that, uh, you know, Odyssey or uh, MRO comes up, they get all the data, you know, she dumps the pictures, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, those orbiters are getting really old. Like, we actually, my group built the radios, which means I'm getting really old, uh, <laughs> that are on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So it launched in 2005. That's like a long time ago. So by the time that we get to, to, to Mars with 2020, those orbiters are going to be are going to be very old, and you know we have to think about you know the DSN has been adding new capability. We're looking at putting on optical communications, and this would be a new feature of the interplanetary network that they could receive optical. So we have options like that, but only because you know the evolution of this ground system has meant that it can adapt you know to what projects need as as we go along. So oh, I have my one picture. Um, I just wanted to show. So this is, don't ask me why it's my, it's my favorite. You look at it and you're like, I don't even actually know what this is. So what it is, it's, it's a picture of her arm and it's got, it's got her name on it. And there's no one there to see it. I mean, no, no matter what you see in the Twitterverse, there truly is no one to see it. Uh, it's just her. She's by herself. Um, and it always has kind of struck me, like I said, you know, I, I have this sense of autonomy. I have this sense of sh her being a person and a personality. How does she react to things? How does she like things? How does she know how to do things? Um, and so I just kind of imagine her sitting there, you know, um, and just going, like, what am I doing here? What? Curiosity. Oh, yeah. Uh, curi uh, curiosity. Yeah. Oh, okay. I got it. I got to get, get, get it. And, you know, and the sending back her tweets. Oh, yeah. By the way, I took a picture of myself. I'm um, cool. <laughs> All right, we're going to open it up to questions, and um, again, you know, wait for a microphone to come your way. And where are our two mic runners, by the way? Let me see. Alice is here. We're going to start at the back. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that you have been working on this for about eight years or so. Um, what kind of things have you learned about yourself that you learned while working here? And, uh, what, you know, how does it feel being part of the history of creating something like this? So this, yeah, this was my first job out of college. Um, I, you know, I liked engineering. I thought it was cool. I wanted to do what I saw people had done before. 
with Pathfinder in, in like 97, and then the, uh, I got here just as the Mars Exploration rovers were landing. Um, for me, I learned a lot about what I like as an engineer and what I don't like as an engineer. I also learned the importance of actually working with incredibly talented and awesome people who make your job fun. Um, Not us. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> other people. Other people. No, uh, kidding. actually, absolutely these guys and, and many other people on this team. It's, it's been an incredible uh, journey um, of kind of just learning everything. I think uh, I, I was lucky enough to have some really great mentors on this project, like Charles Wetzel and people like that, who kind of allowed me to apprentice, I guess, a little bit in different roles throughout the, the course of that, that time. Um, and it's really fun for me. I think one of the most amazing things is to see this project go from really sketches on you know, paper and PowerPoint to actually, you know, those pictures on the surface of another planet. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, people ask, is it what, 10 years is a really long time to get that sort of, like, satisfaction. But I, I'm sure everybody who's worked on this project for many years would say that that investment is totally worth it when you see the end results. Um, so I would say that despite the fact that sometimes this job takes a lot of patience, um, you know, maybe, maybe you would love to be on Mars every couple of years, uh, it, it really is tremendously rewarding, and I, I think that was that was the best thing. And I had, I mean, honestly, like, and I'll, so from a very personal standpoint, um, you know, there were definitely, I think, moments where I was like, "Is it a little ridiculous for me to have a mohawk at work or color it?" <laughs> um, and and you know what? I, I never. I, I would say this: the, one of the greatest things I learned about being a part of this group was that we were always judged on the quality of our work and not our presentation and how how we were as people. I mean, of course, being having a good team dynamic and Everything is really important. You saw us all hugging and high-fiving. It's not just for show. It's because we really, you know, we bonded over the, the years together. So it's been really awesome. Anybody else want to um, answer that while we go to next? No? Okay. Let me um, look for another. Exactly. I agree. Oh, we have a microphone right here. Go ahead. So um, because we're kind of talking about a 50-year anniversary, like my mind is seeing 50 years ago these images of just like, kind of generic balding white guy with slick back hair, pocket protector, big thick glasses to now like just so much diversity. And you guys are like literally you three people are famous. Like people, millions of people know who you are. And I just kind of want to like ask you guys, what do, what do you think about that? Like NASA going from this kind of kind of elitist club to just like it feels like it feels like we're all a part of it, like these images of like I'm gonna cry, but like all these images of everybody cheering for these spacecraft. Like what do you guys what do you feel about that? So so they handed the microphone to the girl. <laughs> um. <laughs> no, actually it's interesting. So I've worked at JPL for twenty years. <clears throat> and uh, actually, I, I started out uh, uh, doing some work in, in the DSN, and I was like, yay, JPL, I'm a D DSN, oh, yay, but I have a job at JPL, and I don't actually care what it is. Um, but I, I remember seeing safety videos, you know, at the time, like, oh, you know, watch how to take care of hardware, you know, whatever. And I am not kidding, it was a guy, like, with a white shirt, pocket protector, black pants. I mean, this wasn't ironic, either. This was the video. And he's wearing a coat, and it's funny at the time. So he's got a pipe in his pocket, <laughs> you do. And one of the things that they're showing, like, you know, be careful that you don't have, I mean, now we wear badges on, on, on chain, and I've never done this, but you could certainly lean over and, you know, crack something with your badge. But they show this guy leaning over, and the pipe's coming out, and it's like, derg, and they stop him like this. And you're like, are you kidding me? Are you? But it was funny, when I came, actually, I mean, you know, Back in the day, there weren't that many women engineers. Mostly it was the administrative staff. Um, and it was an interesting uh, dynamic for me. Like every once in a while, actually still, um, I sit in a meeting and I might be the one woman and there's 20 guys. And it just happens to be because that's the balance. But I, I think kind of like Bobak was saying, um, one of the great things about working for NASA is it is about your ideas. So if I have good ideas, I'm in the center of the room. I can be chief engineer not this project maybe, <laughs> but I can be chief engineer, I can be whatever. And I know that kind of sounds like a platitude, but I think certainly my experience um, has been that way. And, you know, we have more and more people coming in. I mean, part of it is just education, right? I mean, back in the day, I had to keep saying that, you know, it wasn't a good career path for a woman to go into engineering. Why would you want to do that? Um, you didn't see people that looked like you, whether you were a woman, whether you were black, whether you were Indian. You just didn't see people like that, so why would you think that that was something that you would do? And I think now there's, there's so much less of that. There's no reason 
you know, for people not to understand that they can have opportunities in science and engineering. Um, GPL and, and certainly Steve and, and, and Bobak and I have been very involved in, you know, getting out and doing uh, lectures on science and engineering and why that's okay. I actually got to go to Morocco uh, last year to give some talks for the State Department. And I tell you, the kids were looking at me, you know, blonde, white woman, you know, like I was from outer space. So it's very satisfying. You know, it's just a matter of getting the word out. That's, that's the way I feel about it. Um, you know, I'll actually add something to that. Getting the word out, you know, really what has made these missions so popular and them so well known is that you all are on social media and you have made this kind of work really cool again. Um, you know, in, in the last five years with Twitter and all the other social media platforms, and obviously you guys are following NASA in some capacity, and maybe on landing night you were retweeting the landing. But, you know, we have done mission commentary, like what you saw in that video, for every single mission going back for decades. It just didn't get out very well. It only went to the news media, and they take, you know, the 30-minute or 30-second sec chunk of it to play in the evening news. You didn't see all the buildup and the drama. And more in more recent years, we've been able to stream it live. Uh, the entire the entire show, the entire few hours of commentary, and I think that has made you have made all the difference in the world in terms of getting people more familiar with our missions and, and more familiar with the people who are behind them. So, it's thank you guys for doing that. Yeah, there's a lot more channels of communication now, and a lot more options for how we can tell the story of how we do our stuff. Um, just to touch on Anne's uh, comment uh, a little bit, I was sitting in a meeting for Mars uh, 2020 uh, talking about propulsion system stuff for that mission the other day, and it slowly dawned on me that I was the only guy it, <laughs> in the meeting. And I was like, that's, that's good, you know? We, we are making progress there. Um, and, and JPL is just an amazing place because of the diversity of, of people that, uh, that get to work on it. Um, we are super, super lucky to be able to do this fun technical stuff, be given these very challenging technical problems, and be able to share it with the whole world, basically, uh, that they can uh, you know, ride along and, uh, and see the amazing stuff that we're doing. So. All right, let me go to another question. Does someone already have the microphone? Uh, let's see if we go to the very back row there. Thanks. Hi there. Um, my name is Jason Major. I, I'm at Twitter at JP Major, and I love tweeting about all of the space news that's happening. Uh, I remember live tweeting the, the landing. It was one of the most exciting things I'd ever seen, uh, and the excitement that was in the room was, was palpable across the Internet, which was really, really amazing. Um, now, because this social is all about communication with spacecraft and with curiosity, um, and uh, of course other missions as well, what, and then I'll say this for, for all three of you, um, what, what's your favorite information that's come back from curiosity? Uh, of course, other than, you know, hey, I've landed safely on Mars, everything's good. I uh, like the Quaternions a lot, <laughs> but I'm an attitude control guy. Uh, just so you get the joke, the quaternions are four numbers that we use to express how the spacecraft is oriented in space. Um, I, I spend a lot of my time uh, looking at telemetry, and uh, the DSN streams me thousands of numbers that show up on these screens that are in front of you guys. And, and from that, uh, we, in each of our different subsystems, make a picture in our mind of what the spacecraft is doing out there. Um, and so that's the day-to-day -day thing. I mean, that's what we, you know, when we're not on TV, we come in here every day and look at our telemetry and figure out, is the spacecraft okay today? That's weird. What is that little wiggle? Why did it do that? Um, th that, that may not be what quite you were asking about what's the most fascinating science uh, information from, uh, from Curiosity, but, but that's sort of my day-to-day -day quick response to your question. Guys. I have, I mean, obviously the pictures are amazing. I think they're very tangible. Like when you see like where we are at Kimberley with these big, you know, beautiful rocks right in front of us, Mount Sharp is in the distance. It's, it's all like, and it's, it, for me it was very powerful, I think, to see, for example, Pathfinder in 97, to see the, the fact that there's this human-built object on the surface of another planet makes it very just kind of like an experience that I feel like I could 
Sharon. Um, the things that I think I, I love now, I really enjoy the weather report, and just, I don't know why, but kind of knowing, like, <laughs> Mars has weather, and there's temperatures, and oh yeah, I know, oh, it was a cold day on Mars today. Um, that kind of stuff is actually really awesome. I know when the sun sets, you know. Um, one of the things early on that I remember just loving more than anything was uh, the way the rover works is every morning, uh, roughly, uh, you know, 9.30, 10 we send in the, the commands for the entire day. And then in order uh, to acknowledge that, the rover just sends out this little beep. And it's just a tone. All it is is a little tone at the right time that tells you, hey, I got the commands today. I'm going to go do this now. And I don't know why, but that just made me so happy. I'm like, oh, there it is. It's just telling us, oh, I got this. All right. And, you know, of course, later on, the data comes back via the MRO. But that, you know, through the, going through the Deep Space Network, we get this little, just a little chirp saying, yeah, everything is fine. And it's, I don't know why, but it just made me really happy. It was just like a little, like, I, I felt like a very personal connection to the rover at that moment. Um, so I'm going to be extra nerdy and say that I really like the health status stuff. Um, you know, I made the comment about the rover tweeting, and you think, oh, I'm just saying that because I'm in a social media thing. No, it is actually exactly like tweeting. There's something called EVRs. Help me out. Uh, yeah. No idea. We have no idea what it is. But it's basically, so just like, you know, a tweet is 142 characters. So this is one line. It'll say EVR, activity high. I turned on a motor. EVR, warning low. I saw a red light on a temperature gauge that I'm not all that concerned about. EVR, et cetera. And so, uh, as, as Bobak was saying, you know, there's only sometimes that we um, are talking to the, to the DSN or, you know, dumping stuff uh, through, the, rover, uh, through the, the relay. And so, you know, you're kind of sitting there, sitting there, nothing. And then you just see this stream of consciousness, like your super annoying friend who goes and is like, I'm at the mall. I'm going to Abercrombie & Fitch. Oh, my gosh, they're having a sale. Oh, look, this one's blue. I'm going to get the blue one. Wait, I'm going to call Bob. Maybe I'll go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, it just continues this stream down. And it's, it is sort of like it's live tweeting its day. You know, I did this, I did this. And, you know, most of the stuff isn't all that interesting. The pictures are interesting. You know, some of this technical data is interesting. But most of the stuff that it does <laughs> during the day, just like us, um, is not really all that interesting and kind of happens every day. But that gives me this warm sense of normality. Like, this is just another day on the surface. Tick, 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 tick. I did all these things. Bye-bye. Signed off. I'll talk to you tomorrow, Mom. <laughs> uh, before we let you guys go, I wanted to... <laughs> bring up the peanuts and uh does any one of you want to tell the story of peanuts steve i'm wondering you you have been in this room for so many mission events uh yeah, and there always seem to be peanuts for some reason <laughs> uh, i i'm i may have trouble with knowing the whole story but there is a long tradition at jpl of of having um Peanuts for, I think it started with launches and then later became kind of any big critical event uh, that we're doing with the spacecraft that for good luck we would get out a, a bunch of peanuts and we'd pass them up and down the rows and everybody would eat a couple of peanuts. Yeah, I'll tell you a little more about the story. It was uh, dates back to 1957, and uh, we were launching a series of uh, spacecraft, uh, Ranger spacecraft at the time. Rangers 1 through 6 failed. Ranger 7 was a success, and everyone said, well, what did we do differently? And the only thing they could think of that had been done differently is someone who had brought peanuts to Mission Control that day <laughs> just to help people stop being so nervous, and they had passed around the peanuts. Now, so this, since 1957, it's been a tradition here at JPL, as someone else will stay, say here, it's not a superstition, it's a tradition uh, that we pass... <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we've got peanuts for each row, so we're going to put uh, some peanuts on the end of each row so you guys can do what they do and pass down the peanuts uh, during the rest of today. Thank you all so much for coming in and spending time talking with them today. Really appreciate it and appreciate all your great work. Let's give them a round. Okay, um, so you've seen this visualization going on over here all morning, and Doug Ellison was uh, instrumental in, in getting this created. And then, because it used to only be available inside uh, JPL, and now it is available on the Internet just recently in the last couple of weeks, yeah, right? Three weeks ago. All yeah. right, let you explain it. So thank you, Veronica. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. The, uh, the, the, the traditional way the Deep Space Network would share with the world what it was up to, until, up until about 18 months, two years ago, 
was um, very much like the Gantt chart behind that cameraman. Uh, and it's, it tells you exactly what the network is doing, but it takes you a while to figure out what, it's, you know, what does it look like, what, what, what is each line, what do the colors mean. And it's, it's a glorious way of showing people what the network is doing, but it's not particularly kind of uh, intuitive. Right? It's, not, it's not easy to grasp a hold of. And so uh, our team, the Visualization Technology Application and Developments team uh, here at JPL, we worked with some of the, uh, the engineers behind the DSN, particularly a guy called Bark Bowie, who set up some... <laughs> Some pretty cool pipelines. As you can imagine, getting data about what the network itself is doing out to the public is pretty tricky. You've got a lot of firewalls to jump through, but we've managed to make it work. Now, the first step was what you've already seen this morning. We've got this thing working here, and you'll have seen it up in the dark room as well. We have these three screens that show you all the different connections between the antenna and the spacecraft. And you can see there's a whole different bunch of spacecraft here. Some are gray, some are lit up because they're actual live connections. Some are green. That's the one that's reflected over in the, in the, in the big screen at the front of the dark room there. What we've now done is take that and put it online for anybody to look at anywhere around the world right inside a browser. And that's what the screen is right here. So you can get to it from the, the new DSN website at deepspace.jpl.nasa.gov or just for a quick shortcut for you, you can go to eyes.nasa.gov forward slash DSN. I'm sure those of you tuning in uh, via Ustream and so on and so forth and many of you here will have heard about eyes on the solar system, eyes on the earth, eyes on exoplanets. They all live at eyes.nasa.gov. We'll put a slash DSN on it and you get this web page right here. And lo and behold, we hit enter DSN now and we get the current view. Notice they're kind of the same, right? We're now sharing this internal DSN view with the general public around the globe. And you can see you've got the dishes at Madrid, at Goldstone, at Canberra. In fact, this version's even got the under construction dish 35 down in Canberra, right, which will be starting work later this year. Now, this is kind of the, uh, the 10,000 foot view. You can see all the different connections in real time. We can bring up the world map that shows you where these, space, the, these, uh, these complexes are around the globe in real time with proper shading and daytime and nighttime and so on and so forth, the different time zones for these three complexes. But where this thing really gets cool is kind of the really nerdy detail as far as I'm concerned. So let's take one spacecraft and take it. We've already selected up here. We can click on SOHO right here. SOHO is a, is a solar observatory that lives out where the gravity of the sun uh, and the Earth cancel out so it can observe the sun 24-7, 365. And this is a simulated view of that particular dish pointing in that direction at that time of day. Okay? We generated a library of something like 280,000 images to feed that little image in the corner. Okay? And we got some information down here. SOHO is 1.29 million K from the Earth, the round-trip light time. The time it takes for radio signal to get to the spacecraft and back again is 8.6 seconds. And you can see it's station 54. It's pointing at 264 degrees azimuth and 26.3 degrees above the horizon. You can see the weather at the site. It's 9.8, uh, sorry, 10.5. It updates every five seconds, uh, kilometers per hour. Where this thing gets really cool is if you hit more details. This is why I really, really like this tool. Because you can then start to see stuff like what sort of data we're getting back, what frequency it is, what power we're using. So for our answer, you can see right now the SOHO spacecraft is sending data back at 245.7 kilobits per second. Okay? That's like ISDN speeds, early ADSL speeds. Let's find something that might be talking to us a little bit quicker. Let's find, uh, hopefully, Mars Odyssey. The Mars Odyssey orbiter may be doing actually a little bit slower, I'd expect. Let's see what we're getting here. 124 kilobits per second from Mars right now. Okay? And... Everyone's favorite, without fail, is, of course, this guy right down here, Voyager 1. It's been speaking to us all morning. Um, and uh, you may see some spacecraft in here, you know, 100, and 100 kilobits per second, 200 kilobits per second. In some cases, like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, 4 megabits per second. You know, pretty decent communication rates. Uh, Voyager, because it's so far away, talks to us a little bit slower than that. Look at this. 18.99 billion kilometers from Earth. Uh, the universal constant of the speed of light, it takes almost one and a half days for a signal to get to and from Voyager. So if we were to send a signal to Voyager right now, we wouldn't get it back until about 12 hours from now tomorrow. Okay? But here's where it gets really interesting. The data rate, right down here somewhere. There it is. 160 bits per second. Okay? Um, to give you a sense of scale, uh, it would take what we get from kind of some of our, our Mars missions, it would take Voyager 1 a couple of thousand years to send back what kind of MRO has sent back in a year or so. You know, it's incredible data rates. All of this is available online at eyes.nasa.gov. Sorry, yes, eyes.nasa.gov forward slash DSN. It's just a web page and it's agile design. So it works on iPads, iPhones, uh, Android phones, and so on and so forth. It works across all those different platforms. And uh, if you've got any time, I'll just take, if anyone got any questions about either this screen right here or that screen right there or how we made this work, I'll be happy to take a question or two. I'm just wondering for the classroom. 
Like if I wanted to get some of the students to plot any data, do you have data that's available that they could bring up so they could plot something? Like an archive of it sort of thing? Right. It's something we're looking at. This is very much a version one. And what we'd like is people to be able to wind back time and say, what was it doing five minutes ago or an hour ago or so on and so forth. So uh, I hadn't actually, with our Eyes on the Earth tool, we often get questions about, can I plot this data over time? But I hadn't thought about it with the DSM. That would be pretty interesting, plotting things like frequency or round trip light time and so on and so forth. That would be a pretty cool thing. So well, we'll definitely keep that in mind. Thank you. What does it mean when they turn green? Is that just is that just somebody's looking at the data? Or? So, uh, so this screen is actually a mirror of a touch screen that's in there and up in the gallery where our visitors go. And the green one is the one that's featured on the other two screens in the darkroom just over there. So, for example, right now, we've got Messenger highlighted here. And if you look through there, the middle screen is showing you the dish that's talking to Messenger. And the screen on the right is showing you where the Messenger spacecraft is. It's now switched over to uh, the European Space Agency's road desert spacecraft. Just which one is selected for right through there. Okay, thank you, Doug. Thanks my so much pleasure. for showing us that. That's the kind of thing I want to have on my computer screen all day long, just up in that top corner. I think it's so cool uh, to know what spacecraft are communicating right now. All right, so now we have a very special guest from NASA headquarters joining us today. This is Badre Yunus, and he is NASA's associate uh, administrator for space communications and navigation, and he wanted to uh, greet you all and, and tell you a little more about the DSN. Go ahead. Yeah, minor cor yeah, it's on. It's a minor correction. I'm a deputy associate uh, administrator, but I have the overall responsibility for all space, calm, and navigations. Um, behind all of what you have seen are people, dedicated team of technicians, engineers, scientists who made all, all this possible. You know, what they've done is enabling science to take place, exploration, to proceed, return the kind of data from all of our planets in our solar systems. Uh, and with our radar capability, we're able to image most of them. Uh, we have a super duper team here at JPL, and we are very proud of them. So this 50th anniversary is a celebration of their achievement. It's uh, something to be proud of, not only from a NASA perspective, from a, from a nation perspective. The United States ought to be proud of their dedication and their achievement. And we have a lot to look forward to. We are celebrating the past 50 years, but the next 50 years, hopefully, will be much better. Um, there was a question. Do you remember where, we, uh, where were you when the MSL landed on, on Mars? Do you remember these pictures that you've seen, you know, streaming down? What was missing? Streaming video. We want real high definition signals to be coming down from Mars to see it the way we are used to, like now, now our day to day high definition TV and high definition everything. Our appetite for data rate has grown tremendously. Uh, and the same for NASA, you know. Our scientists want the high data rate, want better capabilities. Mo most of our sensors and uh, payload that we put on spacecraft, they are taking more and more bandwidths. The radio frequency, especially now, the portion of it that we use is in contention. It's in contention with mobile telephony, you know, like the cellular phone that you have. These, they do use portion of the spectrum. So we made the decision to go up in frequency. And going up in frequency, we had to look at the architecture of our infrastructure. And we've decided that the 70 meters served us for a long time. They are not suitable to support users at high frequencies. So we are trying to build equivalent, you know, set of antennas that are comparable in terms of performance in meeting the present uh, commitment to our customers, but allow us to go higher up in frequency and support a new generation of missions. And this is ongoing. This, uh, this September, we are going to celebrate uh, the uh, introduction into operation of one of the first antennas we are building. We are also forging ahead with optical communications, you know, communicating through light. We at NASA have seen the light, and the light is wonderful. You know, just, it allows you to do so many wonderful things, and 
uh, and it will give you, um, uh, you know, a large amount of bandwidth, infinite, compared to what we have today. So we are, uh, we started by building the technology, and we recently demo, uh, demoed this technology. We had a payload on board a mission to the, to the moon. You all heard about LADI and the LLCD and the support we provided from the moon down to Earth. 622 megabit per second. You know, at a distance 10 times that of, you know, the distance from here to a geosynchronous satellite. So if you translate that into, you know, the distance into a data rate uh, mapping, you'll be able to get tens of gigabits per second from a geosynchronous orbit. From a deep space, we are looking at building much wider aperture because as you go further, you know, you need a bigger and bigger ear or bigger eye to see the light. <laughs> and that's what we are working, working on much bigger telescopes that will allow us to support uh, deep space missions. In addition to that, because of the competence of the technical team that we have in here, we have entrusted JPL to build our future integrated network. The DSN is one single network among many. We have the Near Earth Network, the Data Relay Satellite Network, and all together we support over 100 missions a day. We transmit through our system a terabyte every day, or actually hundreds of terabytes. You know, an entire library of Congress on a daily basis. So we manage a lot of data. But because of the technical competence, uh, competence we have in here, and uh, much of the changes will occur is, you know, in the DSN hardware and software. So they have been entrusted to lead the NASA team toward a fully integrated network that will provide, you know, uh, at least two order magnitude better performance that we have today. I don't know how many uh, met with me in the past in a similar setting, and I promised we'll have streaming video from Marsh by 2025. <laughs> I still mean it. I, I intend to do it. And definitely with the dedication of the team here at JPL, we'll realize it pretty soon, even sooner than 2025. That's a promise. That's great. And right. I'm open for any questions that you may have. Go ahead. Uh, let me hand you a microphone. Right, Alice, uh, can you get there faster? <laughs> yeah, we'll toss them. <laughs> Um, let's see, I was wondering if um, you mentioned that the 70 meter um, uh, antenna is not suitable for the higher frequencies. Yeah. Uh, why is that? Yeah, as you, as you go up in frequency, the wavelengths start to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Then the panels, the lining of the panel on the surface of the antenna, if they are not lined perfectly, it can eat up from the efficiency of the antenna. So the antenna can become less efficient at high frequency, especially with big mechanical structures subject to, you know, a higher wind, uh, wind load. And was designed early on, you know, that the metal has started to show some fatigue and uh, is not, you know, in a robust state as when it was first introduced. Uh, uh, you know, additionally, we made a lot of progress in rain technology. We can take a bunch of smaller antennas and array them together and in a way we resolve the phase the phasing that exists in time and space between the various antennas such that when we put the, you know, collect the signal from all of them, we'll have a coherent you know, uh, signal. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for coming in today. I know you'll be out at Goldstone tomorrow By as well. By the way, right? uh, tomorrow is going to be a wonderful day. We arranged it for you. You know, Wayne assures me, and we have confirmation from the weather, you know, a person uh, that tomorrow is going to be a wonderful day, and you are going to enjoy, you know, talking about it is different, you know, seeing is believing. You are going to see the 70 meter. You are going to see some of these engine engineers running around doing some of uh, what they do best. And these are the people who are behind the curtain. You know, when I, the MSL landed, they were the first to know, but they were not authorized to, to make that declaration. <laughs> You know, we, but uh, the navigators and the calm people in here are the kind of people that we ought all to be proud of and uh, give them their recognition, you know, very long due, or, or, you know, uh, uh, recognition for all of the work they do. 
they are an enabling entity within the agency without which none of the discoveries, none of the science could have taken place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's so true. They, do, they really do work completely behind the scenes. Uh, so now um, we're going to have our final panel for the day. And, and you've heard from the engineers uh, about how crucial it is for the Deep Space Network for them to know where their spacecraft is and if they're landing safely. And now we want to introduce you to some of the scientists that then sit back and wait for their science data and images to come back to Earth and how they use those. And so joining us... Uh, we have Ashwin Vasavada. He is the Deputy Project Scientist for Curiosity. And that's fine, Marina Brasovic. Marina is a uh, scientist with our Near uh, Earth Objects Office and uh, uses the DSN to study asteroids. And Linda Spilker, who is the Project Scientist for the Cassini mission, which has been orbiting Saturn since 2004. And I will... Take it away. All right, excellent. Hey, how's everybody doing? All right, you can talk to scientists, but we're not going to bore you, I promise. <laughs> we got great stuff to talk to you about, especially how it's all been enabled by the DSN. Uh, I've been uh, a planetary scientist for, um, I don't know, about 20 years now, and 10 years of that has all been on Curiosity. It's been a long road, uh, but it's paid off immensely, and we'll talk about some of that. Um, I think I was thinking about what, you know, what I could share about the DSN, and I think there was two moments in my life uh, in planetary science that I, m I really felt like I was exploring deep space. You know, um, a lot of what I do is staring at a computer and I see pictures come up and it can feel, you can kind of get disconnected and you forget that you're actually doing something on another planet. And one of those experiences was the launch of Curiosity. I know it's like sacrilegious, but the landing wasn't my favorite part. It was actually the launch. And I was standing there in Florida watching this rocket go up and hearing the noise and seeing this huge, you know, multi-story thing go up and thinking, okay, you know, we are actually human beings just throwing something off of our planet to another planet, and it takes that much energy to do that and that much force. And it was, it was an amazing kind of visceral moment. The other time was um, really early when I was in grad school, and I went on a field trip just like the one you're going to go on tomorrow and got to stick my head up into the 70-meter dish and see what it takes to just even send little ones and zeros to something so far away. And to think that, you know, robots out there, you know, hundreds of millions of miles away are, are receiving our signals from Earth. That also was just a, a mind-blowing moment to think, wow, we're doing something pretty amazing and, and all enabled by the DSN. Um, I'll show you one uh, picture, which uh, choosing of the thousands and thousands of pictures that we've gotten back from Curiosity, I'll you, turn your attention to this one over here. This was just from last week. We rolled up to a site called the Kimberley, which is named after a, a geological region in, in northern Australia. We tend to name all of our sites on Curiosity after famous geological forma formations on Earth. This site, uh, like we've been finding all over the crater floor around uh, Mount Sharp, is a place where uh, a river once flowed and water pooled, uh, maybe in lakes or maybe a, a whole series of lakes, laying down what you see here as finely bedded sandstones. These sandstones have grain sizes that are, are like beach sand and then all the way up to things like pebbles and, and gravel. And that tends to mean that water flowed at different rates. Um, slower water carrying the smaller particles, more fast water carrying the, the gravel. And things have kind of come and gone. Maybe shorelines have come and gone. Maybe uh, rivers emptied out into lakes that, that came and went. And it's just amazing to think that a few billion years ago, Mars was so Earth-like. And that's what we're really finding about uh, with, with curiosity, that uh, this planet uh, was uh, a place where rain probably fell from the sky and, and streams formed rivers and rivers carried sand, deposited them into lakes all around this gorgeous mountain that we'll be climbing in the next couple of years. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Marina. Thanks. Hi, everybody. So... Um I'll be talking a little bit how we use um, DSN 70-meter uh, antenna. So uh, probably not many of you know that 70-meter antenna, DSS-14, actually is equipped with a very powerful transmitter. It has a half a megawatt transmitter. And uh, it is the second, it's, it's world's second most powerful radar right after Arecibo in Puerto Rico. And what we use for, we use DSS-14 to ping asteroids and to learn about their exact locations and line of sight velocities, and that allows us to calculate their orbits much more precisely. And then we also use it to image asteroids. 
um, at DSS-14, we observe about 25 to 30 asteroids every year. And in some instances, some of these asteroids end up being really strong radar targets. And the images that we get from them are so, such a high quality that it can only be compared to a spacecraft flyby. So what I'm going to show you now is an example of something that we consider a spacecraft flyby, and that is asteroid Tutatis. Uh, if we can have the video, please. So this is what this is the asteroid that we imaged in December of 2012. Uh, these are radar images. You'll notice these are very different from the images that you would take with your camera, because what what so radar images what they're displaying on vertical axes they're displaying the distance from the radar so this is the depth if you will and then on a horizontal axis what you're seeing is how fast the parts of the asteroid are moving toward the radar away from radar and I know this is not very intuitive but still if you look at these videos you know some things are obvious so these two videos are taken these two they are taken on two different days that's why the radar echoes looks look so different because the asteroid is rotate is is oriented differently in space with respect to radar on the two days and another obvious thing is that when you image it with a radar for a couple of hours you see it's rotating the asteroid is actually rotating in front of your eyes and um the resolution, the pixel, vertical pixel resolution on these images is only 12 feet, which is really impressive considering this asteroid is 4.3 million miles away from us, and we are imaging it down to 12 feet. And what this resolution is really allowing you is you even see the boulders that are lying on the surface of asteroid. And those little bright specks that know to come in, in, you can see them as the asteroid is rotating and they persist. Those are actually the boulders on the surface of asteroid that is 4.3 million miles away. What we ultimately do with images like this is we reconstruct how the object, how the asteroid really looks in three-dimensional space. So uh, we also reconstruct how it rotates. And this asteroid, Tutatis, I'm showing you here, this is reconstruction of its three-dimensional uh, shape based on uh, radar images that were taken actually prior. They are these are older, based on older radar data. But it is a very, very unusual asteroid. Um, this is about 2.9 uh, miles long. Um, it has this regular shape. It looks like these kind of two pieces in contact. This is something that we actually call contact binaries. And even its rotation state is kind of unusual because it, it kind of rotates like a poorly thrown football. So its, it's rotation around long axis is 5.4 days. And at the same time, it's executing this precession with 7.4 days. So it kind of is it's really tumbling. It's tumbling through space. And this is uh, not the... This is not the only one that we have, you know, shape models of. These are some other examples, you know, for asteroids that um, we reconstructed their shape based on the radar data. So there is a binary KW4. There is this irregularly shaped asteroid called YORP. There's another contact binary, HW1. And then there is a Nereus. As you can see, this is a, we really see tremendous diversity in near-Earth asteroids, among near-Earth asteroids. Every time we observe, uh, we really are going in a completely kind of, we, we usually know very little about asteroid we'll be observing. And um, we, you never know what you're going to see. And, and the best thing in a life of scientist is to be, you know, surprised. And we never cease to find, you know, we always end up being surprised because there is so much more things to discover. So um, thank you. Sorry. Okay, I'm Linda Spilker, and I've been fortunate enough to work at JPL for 37 years. And that spans from just before the launch of Voyager through the Cassini mission. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, both of those missions. If you think about it, Voyager was launched about 36 years ago, two Voyager spacecraft. And that's about three quarters of this 50th anniversary we're celebrating with the DSN. So the DSN has been listening to Voyager for a long time. There have been great flybys of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and their incredible moons and rings. And for me, a really exciting moment in just watching those pictures come back from Voyager was actually realizing that there were volcanoes on Jupiter's moon Io, volcanoes going off as we were watching those data, and just incredible what those ones and zeros can turn into, these very beautiful color images. 
And it turns out that Voyager 1 in August of 2012, if we bring up the, the first video here, actually left our solar system and is in interstellar space. Here are the sounds first just before interstellar space. The frequency goes up as the plasma density increases until you hear a very high tone. You're hearing what the wind between the stars would sound like coming back from Voyager. And there's a plasma wave spectrometer uh, that recorded those data. Now Cassini was launched 17 years ago, so that's about one-third of the, the 50 years from the DSN. And Cassini has been sending back data continuously. And, and for me, probably the, one of the biggest, most interesting discoveries for Cassini was actually seeing this tiny moon Enceladus. It's 300 miles across. You could fit it between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And yet, coming out of cracks at its south pole were these jets of salt water coming out and going out into space and creating a very beautiful ring the E-ring. In fact, if you look at the next image, this is one of my very favorite pictures. It was taken last July. It's made up of 141 images and that very outermost blue ring, that's the E-ring being supplied by the water jets coming from tiny Enceladus. And you'll notice there's a bright ring around the outermost limb of Saturn. And if you think about it, that's every sunrise and every sunset on Saturn that we can see at the same time. Also in this image you have Mars and Venus and the Earth, so you have four planets in this particular mosaic. And on that day in July we asked everyone to wave at Saturn while Cassini was taking those pictures. And so there are little photons that had come into the Cassini cameras of all of those people from around the, around the world waving at Saturn. And of course you can't do any of this without the data from the DSN, so it's really pivotal in getting our understanding in increased to actually have those data come back. And so uh, with that, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to take them. Do we have any questions? Okay, <laughs> Alice, we'll get to this one first, and then we'll go in the back there and then over on this side. Sorry, it's probably an obvious question based on what you said, but then would any of that stuff that you're, you're, you all have been discussing been possible without DSN? It would have been, for the outer planet missions especially, if you didn't have the DSN, you think about what they did in some of the early days where you would take pictures, put it on film, and send the film back. And that certainly would be a very long and tedious way. So the DSN is really key, especially for missions that are far away. You know, Voyager with one and a half days round trip light time. That's a long way to send back film. So DSS-14 is really a unique instrument for us. There are only two planetary ra radars in the world, and this is one of two. So uh, we are getting tremendous science every time, uh, you know, when we observe asteroids. And uh, definitely, um, um, I really can't imagine, um, you know, I can't imagine, you know, kind of the science, science productivity that we have without uh, DSS-14. The only thing I'll add to that is, um, you know, it's the DSN is... Uh, completely enabling for curiosity, but we also need the orbiters. The, the amazing thing is we're building a whole communications infrastructure out there. You know, we send commands directly from the DSN dishes to curiosity, but that's a, not that much data, just a list of instructions for the day. But to get all those gorgeous images back, curiosity first talks to the orbiters, and then the orbiters relay at a much higher rate that the DSN can accept from the orbiters uh, back to Earth. So, you know, it's a, it's a link in a, a chain that we totally need to get all these gorgeous pictures back and video one day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we had a question right there on the end. Yeah, hi, uh, Marina. I was wondering, okay, you said those were replicas of the asteroids? They're reconstruction of the shapes. Because so are asteroids that smooth or are they like that movie where they were all rugged and dry? Oh, well, yeah, we are limited with the resolution of the data that we have. So obviously in the past, um, since 2010, we have this capability to image, uh, to image asteroids uh, with, uh, you know, 12 feet resolution. So anything, you know, these, um, these models um, usually match the data resolution, and the, all these are based on a more coarser data, not necessarily, you know, uh, fine details. So, um, so yeah, it is... Uh, 
the asteroids are not definitely that smooth. We know that uh, many of them have these surface boulders. Uh, a lot of them have the concavities. And, and um, I didn't bring you examples of the asteroids where we actually clearly see, you know, something like concavities and ridges and hills. And so there is much more diversity than what I, what I, I just picked up. This was the first thing lying on my desk this morning. So uh, this is what you end up seeing. But we have many more. I mean, this one is pretty rugged if you look. This is Europe, and it looks, it's, it's everything but smooth. This is about 120 meter object, and uh, definitely a lot of structure there. Do we have another question in the room right here in the back? Uh, yes, this is uh, from Marina as well. Uh, as a paleontologist, I'm really interested in asteroids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> mainly because, you know, dinosaurs went bye bye thanks to one. The thing I want to to know, uh, as well as everyone watching and throughout Twitter and all that, so many people are concerned with extinction level events of asteroid impacts. Could you please just tell us the infinitesimal possibility of everything lining up, because it's it's not that certain or even remotely possible. I, it is, but it's just tiny little window of opportunity, more or less. Well, I can tell you that, uh, well, NASA is obviously, NASA through its surveys is keeping a very close watch on, on asteroids and uh, the a um, lot of the survey of a really large ones has been completed. So at this point, we know we have mapped everything that is larger than one kilometer, um, that it, we, we mapped it at the order of, the survey is complete at like 99% level. There's only a handful of objects out there that we haven't seen yet, that we don't know about. So that's a very good news for us, because actually the one that, at, that impacted um, in Mexico and that caused the dinosaur extinction, I believe it was a really big monster. It was something like 10 kilometers. So we know, we know about those objects. But still, there are a lot of smaller objects that can also cause a significant damage. So NASA has a goal to really map out all the objects that are larger than about 130 meters in diameter because they can, they can still cause a significant uh, damage. And definitely efforts are underway to, to really make sure that we know where everything is is in near population. So. Um, you know, I'll add to that also that all of the information about every asteroid that has been discovered and is now being tracked, all of it's online. It's available to anyone. And we actually here at JPL have a Twitter account called Asteroid Watch. And we don't tell you about every single asteroid, but we can direct you to the full list. It's enormous. You'd be surprised. Um, but we do tell you if there's an asteroid that is going to come within about uh, three or four lunar distances. That kind of puts a good picture in people's mind about how far out that is. That would be about a million miles, right? So we, when, when they're coming within that distance, we'll often tweet about them just so that uh, people get a feel for how often that actually does happen. It, it happens quite a bit. I think the one passes between Earth and the Moon um, every couple of weeks, and, and those are mostly They're very, small. very small objects that would just burn up in the atmosphere yeah. even if they did get close to Earth. Uh, we have a question over here in the back. Let me get you the microphone. Yeah. Oh, you've got one. Great. Um, with all the advances that we've had in the past over 50 years since we launched, when, when was Voyager 1 launched? 97. 77. 77. 77. All the advances that we've had in technology since are there any plans to send other spacecrafts out into the universe to get other data that we might not be able to get in, be getting right now from Voyager? Are there uh, any plans to... Well, Voyager is the only the, the spacecraft that's leaving the solar system, and you can think of it as our silent ambassador going out into space. It carries a gold record. It has information about the sights and sounds of Earth, and even how to find us if you can read the pictures on the cover of the record. Uh, there are other missions in the you know, just the planning and thought processes to perhaps go out further to other planets. Uh, New Horizons, for instance, is going to fly by Pluto and then on out to a Kuiper Belt object. So we're slowly expanding the range in which we explore. Um, we are getting very close to the end of our time now on with NASA television. Um, you all are invited to stay and, and answer some more questions after our broadcast ends. For those of you watching uh, on NASA TV or on the live stream, I invite you to Follow now the hashtag DSN50. You'll be sure to get plenty more pictures and information coming from the people who are in this room today. And um, now we're going to do a...
NASA social tradition, which is we take a group photograph at every single NASA social. Now, we are in a very special room today, and we decided here that this requires a very special moment and photo. So I'm going to let these two give the cue, and the rest of you know what to do. Touchdown, Touchdown confirmed. confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Woo!